Good morning, everyone. This is the Community of Practice on Autism Spectrum Disorder and Other Developmental Disabilities. My name is Tim Markle. I'm one of the co-chairs. Today, we are talking about all behavior matters, what counts as challenging behaviors, and for who. Um, and I think it is who. I don't know if it should be whom. I don't know. I always like to, oh, for whom, it just, it just would be sort of fun. But I'm just so excited today that we have a Betty, uh, Betty McClay, <laughs> Betty and Colleen, but Betty is our keynote for today. Um, and what I love about this is she brings a wealth of professional as well as personal experience to this topic. And I am just so excited to learn from her today. So Betty, I am gonna go ahead and pin you. You are free to share your screen and we're looking forward to this. Thank you. Hi, I'm Colleen. I'm Betty's daughter. I'm being tech support, so I'm going to do the screen share. Just a moment. I love that you are tech support, Colleen. Thank you <laughs> so much. That is fantastic. All righty. Just a moment. Okay. Here we go. All right. Okay. Um, the screen should be shared. Can everyone see okay? Okay, I'm seeing nodding. Excellent. All right. I'm going to hand the mic over to Betty. Thank you so much. Good morning. Thanks for letting me join today. I'm Betty McCluskey. I'm an MS in private practice, LPC in Tomahawk for the past 15 years, during which I spent considerable time in Tomahawk schools advising IEP teams. Prior to that, I worked for a year as a therapist in an alcohol and drug abuse clinic five years in an employee assistance program and three years in another private practice. I hold a seat on the board of directors for the Autism Society of Greater Wisconsin and have served as a Wisconsin Facets volunteer parent liaison. I discovered my niche working with autism spectrum disorders when my daughter, the lovely one who's doing tech support, um, who currently holds an MA in English from UWEC, was diagnosed with Asperger's at the age of seven. My husband, a Rutgers PhD in earth science, was also later diagnosed with Asperger's, and I'm pretty sure our cat has it too. I've learned as much as I could about autism, partly out of self-defense and partly out of the altruistic motivation to share what I have learned and give back to the community that has been so helpful for me in my journey. I appreciate having the opportunity to share some of the experience I have had and hope my information will add to your expertise as parents and professionals. I'll leave some room at the end for questions, but please feel free to put things in the chat so that you don't lose track of your thoughts and I don't either. So welcome to all behavior is communication and all communication affects behavior. We keep hearing all these words about challenging behaviors and that makes me concerned because we don't always know what they are. <clears throat> so of course I did a wiki walk and I'll read for you what I found. Challenging behavior also known as, as behaviors which challenge is defined as culturally abnormal behaviors of such intensity, frequency, or duration that the physical safety of the person or others is placed in serious jeopardy or behavior which is likely to seriously limit or deny access to the use of ordinary community facilities. Ordinarily, we would expect the person to have shown a pattern of this behavior that presents such a challenge to services for a considerable period of time. Severely challenging behavior is not a transient phenomenon. I think we all kind of know that, but I wanted to get that out there so we're all just on the same page right now. But who decides when a behavior is challenging? Usually not the child. It's usually the adult in charge, isn't it? And sometimes the adult in charge needs a little help. <laughs> in her book, Brain Body Parenting, Mona Delahook, PhD, tells us that behaviors are communication of an unmet need and that self-regulation is intentional control of one's thoughts, emotions, and behavior. In her book, Interoception, the Eighth Sensory System, Kelly Mahler, MS, OTRL, draws a distinct line between interoceptive awareness and self-regulation. She tells us that the interoceptive system drives the development of self-regulation from infancy and that individuals with poor interoceptive awareness may have difficulty controlling emotions because they don't know what the emotion is. And that without good interoceptive awareness, good self-regulation cannot exist. 
makes sense. <clears throat> In his book, Uniquely Human, Barry Prasant, PhD, tells us that building trust in others to offer understanding and support and the realization that the world is a safe place is necessary to reduce the anxiety that can result in challenging behaviors. He encourages us to follow his simple advice, listen, observe, and ask more. In their book, Autism and Difficult Moments, which I love, Brenda Smith-Miles, PhD, and Ruth Aspey, PhD, discuss the general inability of people with HFASD to indicate in ways that are meaningful to others that they are under stress or having difficulty coping. These signs of stress often go unnoticed by others in the environment. And they made a conclusion that without training or experience, that is, without knowing the connections between meltdowns and ASD, a neurotypical person observing a meltdown may draw uncharitable conclusions. As a result, meltdown behavior may result in rejection, punishment, fear, or judgment. I think we all know that, but it's good to hear it said out loud by people who are the experts. When a neurotypical person without training attempts to intervene and control the behavior of a neurodiverse individual, they're often doing their best in a difficult situation with the knowledge that they currently have. It's important for them to know that meltdowns do not occur without warning. Challenging behaviors are rarely exhibited just to get attention. Support persons must realize that their own behaviors may interfere with a person's ability to regain self-regulation in a challenging situation. And that understanding the cause of challenging behavior can result in positive intervention and teachable moments. Temple Grandin tells us in her book, The Way I See It, that behavior never occurs in a vacuum. It is the end result of the interaction between the child and their environment, including the people in the environment. To bring about positive change in the behavior of the child with ASD, adults need first to adjust their own behaviors and beliefs. Parents don't usually like to hear that when I say that. We do the best job we can. It's all good advice from good researchers and good therapists, but how can we take that advice and move forward to benefit ourselves and those individuals that we support? Changing the way we view challenging behaviors could be a first step to helping those we support learn self-regulation in positive ways without that rejection, fear, or punishment. I have a video I'd like to share, the square hole, which I think is wonderful. And some of you may have seen it. This is the one with the redemption arc because we don't all fit in the square hole, do we? This is a square. Can you guess which spot that goes the in? The square. That's right. It goes in the square hole. Yes. And how about this rectangle? That one also the square. It goes in there too. Yeah. Up next, we've got this thin rectangle. The thin rectangle. Can you guess where that goes? The thin rectangle. That's right. It goes in the square hole. And up next, a cylinder. Hmm. That's right. I think that goes in the, circle. the square hole. Now, we've also got this semicircle right here. Do you see a slot that would fit it's the semicircle? semicircle? The sem the semi That's right, it's the square hole. Okay, up next, the triangle. We know what hole that goes the into, triangle. right? Triangle. That's right, square hole. And up, la up next, we have the arch. The arch. arch. You guessed it. The arch. It goes in the square oh. hole. This is a rectangle. Can you guess where that goes? Square. That's right. The square. Yeah. yeah. Up next, we have a triangle. Do you see a hole in the triangle? The triangle. That's right. The triangle. <laughs> Up next, the circle or cylinder. Can circle. you guess where that goes? The circle. That's right. The triangle. We also have an arch. That goes the into arch. the arch. Or we also have a semicircle. The semicircle. Do you see a hole that would fit the semicircle? The semicircle. That's right. This is a semicircle. There's a thin rectangle that goes in the thin. thin rectangle hole. Oh and last, the square. The square. You guessed it. That's right. The square hole. Yes. Don't we love this? We keep trying to put our kids in square holes, don't we? And our adults and those people that we support. 
but we don't all fit. And I thought that was such a really good representation of it. When we talk about challenging behaviors, usually there is the result of us trying to put someone where they don't belong, but with kindness, understanding, compassion, patience, and learned skills, changing challenging behaviors is possible. So let's look at meltdowns do not occur without warning. And you guys can read a list just as well as I have, um, but there are certainly things in here that we all recognize as challenging behaviors, withdrawing socially, threatening others, questioning rules of authority, becoming argumentative or verbally challenging, even physical aggression, all of the things I've experienced. When we look at those behaviors, where are we? There we are. Um, we need to know that those challenging behaviors happen in what we call a rage cycle, typically. Um, this illustration comes from Miles and Southwick, 1999, Brenda Smith Miles. And we talk about our daily routine at one end and are back to our daily routine at the other. In this rage cycle, those are the only two places that learning can take place because otherwise we're rumbling or we're raging or recovering. Notice that the adult curve is significantly smaller than the, um, than the child curve. That's because well, hopefully we have a little more experience and we can do our rage cycles a little bit easier. We can support a person and the support person behaviors that can escalate a crisis also come from Miles and Aspie. This is just so important, I think, for the people who support others because our behaviors, we are trying to do the best we can. We need to do better, some of us, don't we? And I'll give examples later on where even I can do better because I'm not perfect either. But that raised voice or yelling because oftentimes our kids who are challenging us are loud. So if we yell louder, we can win. That's not true. We make assumptions, just like the ones we talked about, that maybe behavior is based on just getting attention or wanting to have our own way. Sometimes we preach. You know how to do this, John. We've been through this before. Sometimes we back a student into a corner. So ineffective. But sometimes it feels like the right thing to do to keep them from maybe eloping or getting away from the situation where they're supposed to be or staying safe. Saying that I'm the boss here. Seriously, I have a little plaque in my office that says my office, my rules, because I think it's funny. Because in my office, nobody has rules except me for safety. Pleading or bribing never works. Um, my daughter, one time when we were on our way to the doctor, and she wasn't happy and she was sick. And I said, you know, Colleen, we can stop and maybe go to the mall and ride the carousel on the way home. She's about five. She goes, mom, is that a bribe? I'm like, okay, if it works, yeah, it's a bribe. She said, real parents, good parents don't need to bribe their children. I'm like, well, you're five years old. Thanks so much, I needed that. <laughs> Insisting on having the last word, oftentimes that's what we wanna do because that makes us the adults and we're right or bringing up unrelated events. You did this last week, we're not gonna do it again. It's unrelated because a lot of our people don't generalize. They haven't developed that skill yet. So last week's event that was exactly the same in my eyes may not be what they see. We use tense body language. Body language is something that most people on the spectrum don't understand unless they've been taught. I can remember saying to my daughter when she was about five, this is my mad face. She stood there carefully looking at me and memorizing each little aspect of my mad face. Um, didn't help a whole lot, but she's remembered it as into an adult. Um, generalizing, being sarcastic, attacking the individual's character, making unsubstantiated accusations, or nagging. We nag. And even though we're quiet, calm about it, we nag. We don't need to hold a grudge. One of the problems with holding a grudge is that our people on the spectrum typically have moved past the event by the time we're holding a grudge. So a half an hour later, when they say, can I have a hug? Do you still love me? You said we were gonna go to the park. We're like, I just can't do that right now. You make me so mad. We need to step outside of ourselves, look at how they're experiencing the event and maybe be able to say, I'm still not okay from our argument earlier, 
but let's give it 15 minutes and then we'll do fill in the blank. Or acting superior, nobody's superior. We can't throw a temper tantrum. Unwarranted physical force. Literally, a couple of weeks ago, I had a 60 pound first grader who looked like he was going to elope and had in the past and it was a safety issue and it was part of his crisis plan. The officer from the school chased him down, tackled him, got him on the ground, sat astride and held his hands above his head until someone else came as he yelled for help. I think that's a little too forceful. Um, when we mimic the disabled person, and I don't know why people think that's a good idea. This is, this is what you look like. And I did that once to my husband. Um, and he said something that I actually found on a plaque that says, I can't be responsible for what my face does when you talk. Um, drawing unrelated persons into the conflict, asking other people to substantiate what you think is right. Making comparisons, having a double standard, being commanding or dominating. Our people on spectrum don't always get that. They don't understand that there's a hierarchy that maybe the adult in charge is in charge because they're supposed to be and not you. And without that level of understanding, they don't understand what we're doing. Using degrading or insulting, humiliating, embarrassing put downs. I have seen it done, irreprehensible, isn't it? The effective behavior of support persons control that flight or fight tendency that we have, because we all have it, we're born that way. Remember that less is more. Take that breath. Think about what you can do to make that person feel safe. We need to remain calm and quiet, and that's hard to do too, isn't it? With anybody, especially if they're attacking us. We need to remain neutral because we're professionals and that's part of our job. We need to not take behaviors personally. And that is so difficult. I, it's been years and years of training myself to get away from that. You don't like me or you're challenging me. It's not personal. It's just what's happening at the moment as a result of their reaction to the environment. We need to disengage emotionally. That's really difficult. Oftentimes it's our child or a student we're heavily invested in or someone else we care for on a daily basis. Disengage emotionally. I love you. How can I do that? With practice, with training, with insight. Be conscientious of your nonverbal cues. When we started with COVID, everything being virtual, um, I read some of the stuff that was online about how to appear better in your virtual environment. Fortunately, I do a lot of those things anyway because I'm animated, which is really, really good. And I had a woman one time that did a training for us and literally she was like this the whole time. It was kind of scary. Um, so I learned where to sit, what to do and actually use your hands, move your body a little bit. Those things are all so important, but that's our nonverbals. And when we pay attention to those, we can help our kids. We can help the people we love. So we're not gonna point, but we are gonna help them. We're going to invite them. We take deep breaths. We walk, don't talk. That is such a positive thing to do and it's so easy to remember. Oh my gosh. And here's my next video, because I love this guy, because we're gonna talk about um, how, we, how we work a behavior plan and how we're part of it. All right. Tech support, love it. I don't know why it's not showing up on the page. Kids that I talk, behavioral and emotional problems. They don't have great go. goals. They have individualized education plans. Sometimes the administrators in the school don't try to teach anything observed by the principal. I stress. Pulls me aside during the observation. Mr. Becky, I'm going to be sleeping in the back of your room. That's inappropriate. Actually, sir, it's not because he's not being graded. His goal, however, is to not throw his desk through the window. So actually, he's killing it right now. He's doing a fantastic job. You're the one who is being inappropriate. Please keep your voice down. Because if you wake him up, he will throw his desk directly through the window. He'll throw his desk through the window. It's so right, isn't it? It's the purpose of an individualized educational program. And when we're working with kids with challenging behaviors, we've got to remember 
what it actually does and how it actually works. I've used the DPI emotional regulation plan as an illustration here because we've all put these together at some point or another or we've been part of the team that says do you think this is okay and we're busy and we've got a text and we're like yeah it's fine. Um, this gives us places to check the boxes but then add to what we need what we know about a student or person we support to say okay yeah it's totally this is what we see when they start to get agitated but did you also know that this is something else they do? They completely withdraw and stare into space. So just because their face is red and they're sweating doesn't mean that that's that. They could actually have a fever because if they're staring into space, we got another problem. All behavior is communication. We don't all speak the same language, do we? Most of us learn how to communicate in our family of origin. We expect those communication skills to serve us well when we are in our life as adults. Usually they do, but what if we decide to join a different society, a different religion, a different country with a different language and customs, a different lifestyle? I learned communication skills will need to be relearned to fill a new circumstance. We might feel confused or anxious, fearful, frustrated, unhappy, maybe even angry. Like how I felt when I went to Greece with my sister a few years ago. We were in a lovely outdoor restaurant. I asked to use the toilet after lunch and the server pointed to the inside area of a bar that wasn't serving, it was a little dark. So I went inside that door and I found no signs, no indications of the restroom. I came out, I looked around, thought maybe I'd gone in the wrong door. Went back in, looked around some more, saw the initials WC painted in three foot letters on a door. It led to the restroom. My year in college French helped me recognize the WC stands for water closet, which is the closet of water where you have a toilet. Not to be confused with Le Salle de Bain, which is the salon of the bath with a bathtub. And I went, oh, water closet, so I could use the toilet. I had some prior learning, didn't I? I had a little bit of information so I could be comfortable. When a learner is neurodiverse and the support person is neurotypical, communication will be difficult, especially without prior learning or pre-teaching or training to connect them. In essence, we need to be learning each other's language. Each family has its own native culture and outsiders are often alien to that culture. As professionals, we need to rely on the insiders of that family, parents, children, other family members to explain or interpret their language. It could be verbal or nonverbal. And it can be hard for us to recognize that our people may be responding to something in ways that are appropriate, but unfamiliar to us. Once we learn each other's language, communication becomes possible and sometimes even easy. But where do we begin? Barry Prasant tells us we need to listen to what's being communicated, observe how it's being communicated, and ask why they're communicating. So these are not three simple steps to be undertaken in that 10 minute bi-weekly OT session. Not that I'm saying that's a bad thing, but this is a process that's undertaken over time to build trust and reduce anxiety. Trust is built carefully over time with kindness, with respect and with compassion. Most professionals don't have a dedicated 50 minutes or more each week with a person they support like I do but repeated positive exposure to a person, place, or situation will result in trust over time. That 10-minute semi-weekly OT visit may serve only to build trust for the first term of the school year. Progress might not be made until the second or third term, but provided that professional is the same person in the same pl place, trust is built. If that person or place needs to change, <clears throat> excuse me, foreshadowing that change is vitally important to keep that level of trust intact. We need to ask why they're communicating. There's a few things that I'd like to share from my personal practice because we all talk about boots on the ground. Um, so I have permission to share some minor details. Jana was a girl I met when she was about six years old. She'd been significantly sexually abused in a daycare center. The perpetrators had been rounded up, charged and imprisoned and the daycare center was closed. But the trauma that was created for Jana all of her life came to me to solve. 
Janet and I met once a, once a week. We spent approximately 150 hours of individual face-to-face -face time therapy together in the same office before she was able to trust me. She sang for me. She showed me the dances she was learning in a dance class. She drew pictures. We played games. But she didn't share her history or her trauma, abuse in the, in the child care setting for three years. I staffed with my people and I said, really, I feel it's not fair to the state of Wisconsin to take the money for a child who's dancing in my office. And they said, Betty, stay the course. You're developing rapport. You're developing trust. <clears throat> she was always my 4.30 appointment on my late day. One day, she just felt it was time to share. And she did for two and a half hours. She didn't even notice when I called the front desk to cancel my next appointments. I later considered that all the music, all the dance, all the games were her way of presenting her very best self to me so that when she started to share the worst parts, the trauma, I would still like her. We can't know what goes on in people's minds, can we? We build trust. Pop psychology would have us believe everyone needs to be able to trust someone to reveal themselves, warts and all. And in this, time, in this case, pop psychology is right. But how do we build that trust? We need to acknowledge attempts to communicate and try to respond appropriately. We need to practice shared control. We need to offer choices and listen to their voice. Acknowledge emotions. An emotionally disre dysregulated person may appear to be disruptive or inappropriate. Consider those emotions and how can you help? Be dependable, be reliable and clear. Especially with our people on the autism spectrum, that clarity is more important than being nurturing. Do what you say you will do when you say you will do it. Be clear and transparent in your communication. Consider using hidden curriculum or similar materials to explain expectations in specific situations when pre-teaching social skills and foreshadowing. Celebrate success. When a child begins to trust their support term, they can learn to trust the world. What does your person's communication look like? Is it verbal? Is it verbal but verbally aggressive or keening? Is it nonverbal? Do they sign? Do they use assistive technology? Do they use physical, as in body movements, showing or pointing? Are they aggressive? Do they push? Do they shove? Do they hit? Are they distracting? How was your weekend, Miss Betty? Do they refuse? Do they shut down? Do they withdraw? All of these types of communication are valid, although sometimes inappropriate. All communication deserves a respectful response. All respectful responses can help to develop a trusting relationship. Above all, the support person needs to remain calm, neutral, and professional. So examples from my practice, uh, Peter, and of course names are changed to protect the innocent. I met Peter when he entered seventh grade. I had actually received a written warning from his case manager at his middle school when I requested records. At our first appointment, he focused on my gold desk clock. I've given you a picture. Lovely gift I received from my best friend's mother as a wedding present. Very expensive. He wanted that clock and he was going to have it. When I refused to let him have it or touch it, he left the session without permission and began keening in the outer vestibule, disrupting my sweet mates and kind of scaring them. Janie, I met when she was in third grade. She was a behavioral problem in her parochial school. Not yet toilet trained. She had no friends. She was unable to read. She wanted to make friends. So she and I began to work on social skills and behaviors. When I tried using written materials with her, she complained of feeling tired or she'd distract me with questions about my cat or me. I didn't realize her reading skills were significantly below a third grade level until I got her records. I met Kenny at age 12. He refused to communicate with me. Sitting inside his hoodie, you know how they do that. The knees go up underneath. They pull it all the way closed. All you see is it's much of their face and then they won't look at you. So he would sit inside his hoodie. He remained mute. 
His primary care physician had suggested he had ODD, and his previous therapist had discharged him as non-compliant with therapy. I met John at age 16. He was addicted to video games. I suggested a break from video games, and he attacked me physically. His father had to pull him off of me. <laughs> All of these communications were valid. Some inappropriate or dangerous, but valid. My job as the support person is to build the trust that needs to be in place to allow my clients to accept me and engage meaningfully with me to facilitate their successful communication with me and others. <clears throat> By remaining calm, neutral, and professional in these challenging interactions, my person recognized the environment in my office as a safe place and a place to grow. The single biggest problem in communication is the illusion that has taken place. And in these situations, sometimes it did not take place. In Janie's case, we had established a trusting relationship. However, her poor reading skills, her low functional IQ, and her receptive language disorder created problems for us when trying to use printed materials. I defaulted to Jed Baker's picture books for social training, and when she was older, used Laufenberg's social skills video programs, both of which were remarkably successful for her. She started to accomplish her goals and that started to build more trust with me. We took control of her learning style through visual communication and shared the control in her sessions. After transferring to the public school system, she did learn to read at a fourth grade level eventually, graduated high school, succeeded in project search, and works part-time as a dietary aide in an assisted living facility. How cool. In Kenny's case, we established a trusting relationship by me, allowing to take the necessary time to become familiar with my office and comfortable with me. I didn't wrestle with him for control of this situation. I let him know that we would be spending 50 minutes together each week and that I would respect his need for peace. I lowered the lights. I let him sit inside his hoodie. I invited him to share when he was ready, which he was eventually able to do. He also needed to process the previous therapist who said he had ODD. I never saw the symptoms of ODD that were suggested by the primary care provider, only his ASD and anxiety, which we acknowledged and he was able to make progress in both areas. In John's case, we had not established a rapport or trust. I mistook his agreeable present presentation as a willingness to work with me through therapy. His parents asked for advice. I asked appropriate questions. I gave my best advice. That didn't work well, did it? John attacked me physically. He was tall and broad-shouldered at 16. He put his hands on my shoulders and his chest on my head and began to push me down into the chair with force. He obviously wasn't communicating his dissatisfaction with the session until that time. He was angry. His parents were shocked. I was fearful and somewhat injured. I responded professionally, thank goodness, but not well, repeating that he was hurting me and asking to be let go. A better choice would have been for me to allow John to talk about his gaming addiction, and that's in quotations, and for me to acknowledge John's emotions related to his passion before suggesting interventions. We had to terminate therapy. We need to celebrate success, don't we? In Peter's case, I explained that the office rules for a session, like I do with everyone who comes into a session in my office, and he agreed to those rules. Don't assault our therapist. We don't call me anything I can't say out loud to mom without getting a lot of trouble. But my clock was not part of those rules in that conversation. So when I added clock rules, he refused to comply and eventually left the session, keening in the vestibule, disturbing the sweet mates. My approach was to explain that keening was not an appropriate communication for this situation. When he returned for a second session, surprise, we created a social story that was effective in controlling his verbal outbursts. Another social story was effective in controlling the desire to have my clock, which I still have. When we shared control over the situations through social stories, which he helped to write, we were able to develop that trust and work together for his success. He is currently living in his own apartment nearby. He works 20 hours a week as a, at a restaurant. Um, 
He has his own life, his own transportation. His only thing is a rep payee because he's never been good at the maths. How cool that he was able to be so successful. Dependability is key in a trusting relationship. They need to know what to expect from us. I apologize for that. As we go forward as a team, reliability is defined as being trustworthy, performing consistently well. My rules in my office are always my rules in my office. One of the things we don't do is we don't swear here. And I fine for swearing. And I find 25 cents for, excuse me, the S word, or the C word, um, crap, excuse me, um, 50 cents for the S word and a dollar for the F bomb. And if you string them all together, I get to decide how much it costs. However, the same goes for me because I am not exempt from swearing and I have to pay them the same amount of money to take care of that. Pauline, when she was little, came up to me one day with a complaint about her case manager or somebody. She's about, I don't know, maybe fifth grade. She puts down a couple quarters in front of me. She goes, mom, we need to talk about Mrs. Jones. I'm like, this is not pay to play. <laughs> so that backfired once in a while on me. But I always find my kids, and if they don't pay me in session, I send them a bill. And it's inappropriate language fees. They expect it, they know it's coming, their parents know it's coming, and they pay me, which I think is amazing. But it's part of that respect, trust, and dependability that we establish as counselor and patient. How we present to our people is more important than what we say. Regulating ourselves, kindly communicating that regulation through looks and touch, if appropriate, mood and general disposition helps our people learn what appropriate self-regulation feels like, allowing them to mirror that regulation to us and use it in present and future situations. When we regulate ourselves, we can begin to use co-regulation with our people. Co-regulation, and I love it that someone has finally defined it, and I'll give you that, is nurturing connection of another individual that supports regulation needs through the use of strategies, tools, and calming techniques in order to self-soothe or respond in times of stress. Co-regulation and self-regulation are part of the developmental progress. Co-regulation begins when we begin caring for our people. Colleen was born in 1993. I can talk about her because she can't sue me. Um, and that was the first year that Asperger's was in the dsm 4 There wasn't a whole lot to go on. And she was a terrible sleeper. And that was unfortunate for everyone. But she would get so fussy sometimes at night. And so what I did, and it was absolutely right, but I didn't know at the time, I thought, what can I do to get her to calm? And I knew to do the breathing and to make the sleeping sounds and all of those things. But what I did was I visualized us inside an egg. So we had this bubble that was just she and I, and then I would breathe and then I would rock because we had a nice little glider in that nursery. And she would always, always calm. And when she calmed, she could sleep, which was amazing. And as I read about co-regulation as becoming such a buzzword right now, it's so right and it's so true. And while as professionals and other providers, we can't always touch the people that um, we support because it's not always appropriate and it could be misinterpreted, but we can make that bubble around ourselves in our mind that glows out to them and helps them regulate themselves. So think about that and do a little bit of that mindfulness when you have to work with some, someone who's having trouble regulating. We develop communication skills, shared language, and give and take in our relationship. It takes practice, perseverance, trial and error, relationship repair, failure, and success. The relationship repair part is so much of an important piece here. Um, I have a a person I still work with from time to time, even though I'm retiring. Um, I use the term gender friend, but transitioning from one gender to another. And we had talked about it years ago, maybe in middle school. And middle school is a, is a dicey place. Who knows what goes on in middle schooler's brain? And we had talked about uh, 
gender transformation at that time, I just kind of let them get to age 16 and kind of get that gray matter gelled a little bit more before we talk about it. And now in early 20s, it's coming true. But we were able to sit down and this person was able to say to me, you know, when I was in middle school, I really felt that you dismissed my concerns about my gender dysphoria. And that really bothered me. How can we get past this together? Because I don't want to lose you as a therapist. How cool of him to have come that far and be that self-advocating. But I needed to take a step back and say, I am very sorry if that's what I did. Certainly it wasn't my intent. And I totally respect you as the person that you were and as the person you're becoming. So please, can we talk about this? And the relationship continues really successfully. Recognizing our shortcomings as the providers, as the counselor, as the parent, as the teacher or the para, all of those things need to come back to us and we need to be able to look in the mirror sometimes. Many of my clients are working on social skills and self-regulation as goals. In those cases, helping them self-regulate, feel at ease in my office can be challenging. Small talk doesn't typically work with people on the autism spectrum until we've taught that skill. Sometimes we'll begin sessions with a game like these, like Uno, our talking game, like the ungame, or beginner's yoga. These activities can help open our connection and support self-regulation. What I do in that case is I'll say, well, it's kind of hard to get started today and let's just do some yoga for a while. Um, we'll do 20 minutes and then we'll get down to serious work. And usually there's the <sighs> that we saw with our person in the square hole video going, yes, she's not gonna ask me how my day was or how I did in my science project. So right away, we can establish that trust and a communication level that isn't based on my neurotypical need to make small talk and make myself feel more comfortable. They help our people connect with us and become ready to learn. And that's another one of those buzz phrases, but it's so true. When a person is ready to learn, then learning can take place. We all know even the best teacher will have difficulty teaching people who are poorly regulated. When we help our people self-regulate, we encourage effective learning. Some of my clients have alexithemia or poor emotional awareness. We talked about Kelly Mahler earlier and the interoceptive part. Alexithemia makes it difficult for these people to identify and describe their emotions. Rates as high as 65% among young people with ASD were noted by Berth Hills and Hill in 2005 and by Bird and Cook in 2013. It's important for us as professionals to recognize that these people are not without emotions. They have merely not learned to identify and share their emotions. So for us, again, to take that step back, to help co-regulate, to give them the space to talk about those emotions or give them the tools, the behavior charts, the feelings charts, those can all help identify the feelings and get us on track as people who support those people who need us so much. Kelly Mahler tells us that without clear awareness of interceptive signals, effective self-regulation does not naturally develop and improve as we grow. And that's a big piece of research right now in the UK talking about how emotions develop as we grow and what can stop those emotions from developing. If anybody would like more information about that, please email me or send me your email in the chat. Behavior can be changed in specific situations. However, until the individual and their support team identify the underlying cause of interoceptive awareness, no generalization will occur. Mahler has created a program called IA Builders, Interoceptive Awareness, which also utilizes visual supports and social narratives to help increase interoceptive awareness to help improve self-regulation. It's a good program. It takes some work and some knowledge on the part of the provider, not something you're gonna pick up in five minutes. The Incredible Five Point Scale by Kelly Dunbaran and Mitzi Curtis is another excellent tool to help with self-regulation, as is When My Worries Get Too Big, also by Kelly Dunbaran. As professionals and carers for individuals with ASD, it's important for us to help those we support identify their emotions and physical feelings 
so as to help them find effective ways to self-regulate. Compassion and empathy for our people helps us teach them regulation skills and helps them trust us enough to learn and internalize the information. But what about that emotional regulation plan? It's always necessary, isn't it? Especially if we have an IEP, but it needs to be a collaboration between a person and the support team. Almost every expert in the behavioral field has a sample plan for us to use. Use whichever one works best or whatever your group authorizes and approves of. What makes that plan valuable is how effective the plan is for the support person and the individual with ASD. I had a wonderful IEP meeting a few years ago that shocked me to my core. Um, it was a student with challenging behaviors, middle school, of course, male, fairly large. Um, he would get violent, verbally aggressive as well. And the crisis plan, the emotional regulation plan, the behavior plan, all called for police intervention. Our town has 3,500 people. Sometimes we have an officer at the school and we try to do it all the time, but not always. Sometimes those people are called away for other duties. So if there's a problem, there's not an officer on staff, we call the police because who can put hands on? Virtually no one. And if he's violent, what are we gonna do? The father who was very big and very loud says in a circle of about 10 people with our little desks like we do, slams his hand on the desk and says, for F's sake, if the best thing you can do for my kid is call the police, I don't want to have anything to do with you people. Slams out of the room. We all kind of look at each other like you do. And the wife is still there and she's verbal. And she says, I'd like to hear what else, what else you have to say. So the person conducting the IEP continues with what we're going to do with a crisis plan and all this. And she says, you know what? He's right. You're all just a bunch of fill in all the blanks you have with all the bad words that you know. She slams out of the room too. There's 10 of us still sitting there. We look at each other. We're like, well, now what do we do? And we actually took a breath, continued the IEP and sent the results to the parents and had a follow-up meeting because it was the best we could do at the time. I had never seen parents react that strongly. Um, again, it needs to be a collaboration. But I think that maybe the parents should have seen that crisis plan with someone, maybe with me, before we got to the IEP table with all the time it takes to get that, get that many people together. We could have spent our time better. The beliefs, training, and attitudes of that support team. When carers assume a child can self-regulate and the child can't, Mona Delahook calls it the expectation gap. And I like that term because what we're expecting and what they can actually do is so significantly different. Like with Janie not being able to read. How was I to know that? I have some beautiful materials in children's books on how to make friends, how to do a social situation. None of them worked for her. There was too many words on that page. When we impose that behavior plan, an emotional regulation plan or any other catchphrase plan without collaboration, we risk that expectation gap, don't we? I think we've all pushed someone further than they can go at some time or other, and that person hasn't met our expectations. I love Dilbert. Isn't it great? Isn't it great? Haven't we all had a review like this too? In graduate school, I had an excellent practical mentor who used to ask us after we'd done a session that we had to record and review with him if we thought our clients were compliant with their treatment goals. And if we said we thought they were non-compliant with treatment goals because we're those first year interns, he'd say, so whose goals are you expecting them to achieve? Yours or theirs? That was kind of um, eye-opening for a lot of things. Oftentimes when I make goals, I go back and revisit. Parents don't understand that they can go back and revisit those IEP goals. Um, we wanna see John do X 80% of the time with success. And John's only giving us 20% success. Maybe we need smaller goals. Maybe we need different goals. 
Maybe John's bored, or maybe he really is ODD. Whatever the reason is, we need to be able to go back and revise those goals to fit the goals of the person we support and not just us. Collaboration and planning, celebrating successes, rethinking failure, reformulating goals, redefining success helps our people achieve their goals, builds that trusting relationship, and allows for continued success. George Bernard Shaw, who I absolutely love. Progress is impossible without change. And those who cannot change their minds cannot change anything. And haven't we seen that so much? So when we think about that and we go back to the idea that perspective taking is so difficult for people on the spectrum. And teaching perspective taking is without a doubt the most difficult thing that I attempt with people on the spectrum. We are all a hive mind. And trying to get out of that hive mind for them to see that we are not part of that hive mind is really, really difficult to understand that I might have a different feeling than you do about something that's happened. Like when John attacked me in my office. I called the parents on the phone and I explained that um, we wouldn't continue therapy because of safety reasons and that I wasn't going to sue them, which I wasn't going to do. She was absolutely horrified. Because I don't know what she thought. Her expectation was that we would just continue with therapy and John would continue to assault his therapist. The expectation gap. When we can change the mind, we can change the behavior. But we've got to get into that interoceptive awareness. We've got to be able to make that connection with our people to make the change occur. And the change is not always going to be what we expect. Sometimes it's better, isn't it? I left enough time for questions today, um, and I've left a couple of discussion questions for the group. And I think, Katie, you'll do those in the breakouts later. Yes, and we did have one question um, that was for you while you were talking, so I thought maybe we could start with that one first. Good, okay. Um, could you talk about how compliance as a way to approach behavior and how to change that mindset of professionals and how to shift approaches away from that? So. It sounds like if you're if the people around you have this compliance mindset, that um, this person is looking for um, ways to help people on their journey to get off of the compliance mindset. Oh, get up! <laughs> Make the wheels on the bus stop going round and round. Right. <laughs> um, and that is really really hard to change that mindset. The only and and I've been in the schools, um, in the local schools a lot, supporting my people on the spectrum, especially IEP meetings and doing crisis intervention. And the only way that I have found to make that possible is to demonstrate it through my own work with that person I support. So I give people the example, when we're sitting in the IEP meeting and someone's saying, here's that crisis plan and this is the only thing that's gonna work. And if John can't do that, we're gonna send him to a day treatment program. And John's in the corner going, a what? That's a concern. Everybody's fearful then, and that doesn't work. But what I can do is I can say, oh, wait a minute. Let's talk about what happened last week and why we're here today. Why did John elope? And how did you get him back? And here's what John and I talked about in session. So I can share that the reason John was running was because there was a bee and it was spring and there's that beautiful crab apple tree and he saw the bee and he's allergic to bees. And he knows that he's allergic to bees and he carries an EpiPen and he's only eight. So what do you do when there's a bee? You run as fast as you can. So when I can explain that there's a reason for the behavior, even though they weren't aware of it, and this is what had actually happened, I can explain that John and I will work with the EpiPen in session, that we are going to talk about why it's not a good thing to run that fast. And yes, to get away from the bee, but not to get off of the school grounds. I think when the team feels that they've got support from another logical, re reliable source, they're much more effective at getting away from that compliance-based model. And they're much more open to listening to the reasons for the behavior. And part of it, and I am, I could be more tactful, but we don't always have enough time. Part of it is letting somebody else do their job for them because people are busy and burnt out and overworked and underpaid. And if I'm a therapist who has 
50 minutes to spend in session, then great, I can approach that for them. And that's my fax, let's go from there. Does that help at all? Is there more that goes with that? Not in the original and I, I oh, I think that was it. Yes, thank you. Okay. I'm gonna go to the chat and see what's up there. Um, because, oh my gosh. I wrote them down. Oh, did you? I did. Oh my gosh. Yep, yeah, we're we're having this whole other people are having this this great discussion based on what you are talking about, Betty, and, and sharing things. So there's there's a lot of community going on. There sure is. Um, um and people, I believe that we would be able to see if you raised your hand using the Zoom reactions icon down at the bottom of your screen. Um, that should pop up and we should be able to logically follow people through who have their hands raised. So if you would like to ask a question, please raise your hand. You can also put it in the chat. We have multiple people watching the chat to make sure that the questions get to, to Betty. Um, so Katie just brought one up if you want to talk about how okay. much insurance needs are regulated by DPIC. It's a very interesting question about, um, yeah, about how do we, how can we help parents? That parent school connection, and I just, I knew it would come up, and I, I could go all day on that, because um, I've been on both sides. I've been on all three sides, actually. I've been the professional in the meeting, the parent in the meeting, and it is really hard. Um, but I do think that being able to trust each other, being innocent until proven guilty, is really important. Um, Parents are doing their best. I always assume people are doing their best. And parents are trying so hard to get their child the education that they need and to keep them in school. Great. That's what we all want to see. I don't care what the reasoning is behind it, but we want to see that parents are involved. Sometimes parents need to be more involved um, and establishing some contact with them because what I hear from parents is um, I never hear anything from the school until something goes wrong. You know, I'm sorry that everybody had to complete the ed TPA and has more paperwork to do than the kids have homework. And that's unfair. Um, I recognize that. However, it doesn't take a whole lot to set up an email list on your computer, ask the professional that says, John had a great day. Or you know, there's so many programs available that says John's lunch account is empty. Um, Janie needs more markers. There's so many things available that we can do through technology, through technology that keep us connected to the family. And it is up to the family to talk to me as the professional it's, or me as a therapist. When I talk with families, my big thing is are we using the same language to communicate with your child? I came toe to toe with another therapist one time who said that an autistic apraxic child did not need to learn the word no. Yeah, you do need to learn the word no because neurotypical people say no. And they yell no when you're crossing a street or when you're doing something dangerous or you're going to touch something you shouldn't in the science lab. So we need to be able to speak the same language. And that's where I think that parent school connection is so very important. And parents need to be involved with the teachers and teachers need to be involved with the parents. And yeah, there's lots of time that's unpaid that goes into that. I don't think there's a way around it. I think that we need to be present for each other, parents for teachers and teachers for parents. Um, but I think it all comes down to that, the whole very present idea of compassion and kindness and understanding and just assuming people are doing their best. Isn't that hard? I'd rather be judgmental and harsh and say, you know, if they would try harder, this would be so hard for me. That's probably not it. Most people are basically good. Like to be more precise. Next. So there is a, um, in the chat, Betty, there is a mm -hmm. note from Kristen Schutz about a client that you may be able to add some insight on that the client is dealing with the school. School thinks the parent is doing too much and overwhelming him. Oh, dear. Yet the parent asks the school for help and they say the child is not motivated and does not want to self-start. It is his way of showing he does not understand. They have told him he is just lazy. Oh, it, excellent. Uh, sorry, um, snarkiness is part of my personality. Um, 
the lazy word drives me nuts. Unmotivated drives me nuts. One thing that I don't think people know enough about is autistic inertia. And autistic inertia is the inability to start something or the inability to stop something. And it's, it's, it's common, it's so common. But usually what's happening is that our person that we support either doesn't know how to get started and we need to think small steps, not baby steps, minutia. Um, pick up your pencil. That small. Turn on your computer and turn off your game. Starting really, really small um, to helping our people get off the mark and get motivated, if you will. Because when autistic inertia takes over, there is no way for them to get past it except with some help. And we are the help. So our question isn't, John, why aren't you doing your homework? Everyone else is. Our question is, John, do you know how to start your homework? Do you know that this is a fairly easy project? You have five math problems to do and I can help you get started. And then you can show me what you need to know from there. But we're all trying to do things quickly. And that's the really hard part about it. We don't have enough staff and we're burned out. We know that. But, but asking the questions, um, bringing it down to smaller and smaller areas. I had a kid. <laughs> And I say kids, and I'm, I can't say kiddos. I, I think it sounds, I don't know, weird. Um, but I had a kid, met him in seventh grade, when kids start to smell extremely bad and um, wouldn't take a shower, like wouldn't take a shower, refused the showers, refused the baths. The mom got a pass to the water park nearby, and they went twice a week to the water park so that this one could get clean. I worked with this kid for over a year to figure out what was wrong with the shower. I'm thinking sensitivity to the water on our skin. Could we do a bath? Could we do some aromatherapy? Could we do music? Um, is there a color or a light in the bathroom that's hard? Finally, it comes out literally a year later that the bathroom is cold. And then when he gets out of the shower or gets out of the tub, he's cold. The bathroom is in a corner like facing north. And it's got tile walls. And yeah, it is cold. I said, Mom, here's the problem. Mom bought a small space heater. Kids clean as a whistle. But that's that small thing. We're saying he's refusing personal hygiene. No, he's not. He just doesn't want to be cold. And I totally get that. But finding out what is that underlying cause, one more time, takes us back to small steps, time, and investment. And we don't always have the time, so we just have to think faster, I think. Does that help? Oh, this, <laughs> this is great. Someone says that um, at many anime conventions where many people don't have access to showers, the pools are the best place to get clean. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, especially when it's a choice and it's an option. But that's a really good point. Thank you, James. Where are we? Please feel free to raise your, you use the reactions key to raise your hand so we can see it um, or put your questions or comments into the chat so we can continue the discussion. Um, there's some wonderful ideas going on in the chat. Um, yeah, and I agree with people. I've never really heard the term autistic inertia before, which shows you again that I don't get out much. So <laughs> really. Thank you so much for introducing that. I threw some of the top Googles, um, which again are just suggestions, not endorsements. Exactly. Um, exactly. But I and I love the fact that it, it then, you know, the, the professional term executive dysfunction, um, executive functioning is, you know, with my, with my son, it's just like, you know, I took him to a conference once um, so we could learn about executive functioning together. Um, and we just never seem to be able to get the conversation started after we ended. Um, so it was really inertia. So I totally love that term and breaking right. down into minutia. It's so valuable. Inertia is different than burnout. Oh, and Colleen has um, a question in her chat. How is on is inertia different from burnout? Um, and burnout, absolutely, it's a thing, isn't it? We all know that. But burnout, 
for people on the spectrum can look like refusal, oppositional defiant, regression. withdrawal, regression, um, because going back to what's comfortable and what's easiest is what most people do, um, neurodiverse or neurotypical. However, with our neurodiverse population, getting back to that comfort zone can be really, really important in regression. Don't we all just need grilled cheese sandwiches and tomato soup once in a while, um, but not every day. But inertia is just not being able to start or stop. And it's not to do with burnout. It's not because I don't wanna do it again or I've had one too many ABA drills today. That's burnout. Inertia is, okay, I've done this same ABA drill every day for five days with this particular instructor and I know exactly what to expect. But my instructor is wearing a green shirt today and I don't do green, so I can't engage. Absolutely, it's autistic inertia. And without the communication that says, Miss Betty, I, I don't do green. You're gonna have to do something about that shirt. It's up to me to figure out what it is. And if I have that knowledge and I can ask myself, does it look like inertia? And I'm taking it down to smaller and smaller steps and it's not working, then it might be burnout or it might be withdrawal or refusal. But it's gotta be me thinking about what are the possibilities for the behavior and how can I help my person explain to me what the reason is, whether it's verbal or nonverbal and hopefully not threatening. Does that help? Um, somebody also asked about translating the, uh, some of the slides into Spanish as a resource. Um, I told them that was chill. Okay. And I'll leave that to Katie and Colleen. <laughs> I love being able to hand something off. Thank you, women. <laughs> oh, here's one from Allison. She says, um, why are our kids on the spectrum taught to identify emotions in others, like with pictures and thought bubbles, but not to identify their own, how their own body feels when they have an emotion? My child doesn't identify hunger. It is stomach pains, tired and grumpy, same with emotions. Oh, that's an excellent, excellent question. Did everybody hear that? Yeah, okay. Um, again, um, interoception. Sometimes the professionals don't do that work. Sometimes they don't have time or goals are different or we haven't revisited goals um, and we don't teach that. I'm a behaviorist and so I teach things more physically, more realistically. Um, one of the things I always have in my office is Play-Doh which is a nice thing for kids to manipulate, especially if they're stressed. However, it also um, is an excellent representation of poo. And I can show kids that when you squeeze the Play-Doh, it'll come out the bottom of my hand. And that's a poo thing. We have to be, as parents and as professionals, we have to be creative in the way that we help our people understand those interoceptive feelings. Um, the hunger thing, hunger is such a weird thing. Mouthfeel is such a weird thing. Um, but explaining that this feeling that your tummy hurts could be a hunger thing. And with that comic book conversations, something that's illustrating is going to be really good, just like with the Play-Doh um, and maybe using plastic foods to say, okay, here's your favorite food. You like to eat pizza. If we don't have pizza and your tummy feels like this, we'll have to have something else. What's another thing you could eat? Can we have Lunchable pizza? Can we have fill in the blank pizza? Can we have a peanut butter bar? What can we have that will make that approximation? Because a lot of times our learners make rules for themselves and we don't know what those rules are so that maybe pizza is the favorite food and it's the only thing that makes our tummy feel better. So we can only eat pizza. So offering options, um, the only thing that makes me feel better is to swing. Okay, grandma doesn't have a swing in her living room and you're gonna be there for the whole weekend. What else can we do? Can we bring your bike? Can we bring something else that's gonna give you a spinning sensation? Do you have a wiggle seat? Do you have a spinny chair? 
So offering options because our rule-bound learners can't always discover an option for themselves. So it goes with, with proprioceptive. It goes with um, thoughts and feelings and processes and emotions. So if all you feel is angry, what else feels like anger? Sometimes when you laugh so hard, you almost wet your pants feels like anger. We have that same rush of adrenaline. So it's up to us um, to explain to the professionals that our kids don't get it. And it's up to the professionals to help you and them explain to your child or your adult why that's important for them to understand, why that interoceptive learning is so important. Another one? Yeah, there's another question from Emma who says, what have been your best strategies building relationships, especially with struggling parents? Transparency, direct communication, and honesty. Um, I have gone toe to toe with parents who disagree with me strongly and respectfully tell them that things are going to change in this way, but not in their way. I had a woman, I'm a Harry Potter geek. I am such a geek. Um, if no one knows what to buy me as a gift, go to the Noble Collection and point to A if I don't have it. Um, and I have posters in my office. I have a little eight inch statue of Dobby who's beautifully recreated. I had a mom come in with a, a child I worked with from age seven to age 19 actually. And she was, I loved her. I loved her. She was rough and gruff and, and, and I just loved her. And she was snarky. And she said, I'm looking around here and I think that we're not going to be a match. And I said, okay, why do you think that? Not every mechanic fix says every car. And she said, everything I see is Harry Potter, Harry Potter, Harry Potter. I mean, like seriously, I have movie posters on the walls. <laughs> she says, kids need to learn that you can't solve your problems through wishes and magic. I said, oh, perhaps you haven't read the Harry Potter books and looked at the social skills and solidarity of a team building project and the altruism of doing the right thing for the world and fighting evil. This is all really good stuff. And I communicate and connect really well, especially with kids your age. She sat there for a moment. She said, well, I'll give it a shot because I'm not paying for it. But we only get three sessions. If it's not working, we'll do something else. And I said, great, let's get started. But seriously, um, I have gone toe to toe. I have a, a mom, actually a grandma raising a high schooler right now that says to me, and, and remember, I'm retiring, uh, kind of. She says to me, this IEP nonsense, because it's nonsense, of course. She's almost 70. Um, this IEP nonsense doesn't work for anyone. All it teaches these kids is that they'll be coddled and someone will take care of them all their lives. They need to get jobs and they need to pull themselves up. Wow, I'm glad you're so understanding and compassionate. Thanks so much. Um, I say, no, that's not the idea of an IEP. And if you look at the 3M history of hiring people on the autism spectrum in their extremely high level IT positions, you'll find that they have laundry services, they have people who do haircuts on, on site, they, you can order your, uh, in the St. Paul office, you can order your lunch from the cafeteria and they'll deliver it. So you don't have to go out and be social. Yeah, yeah, they do take care of their people so that they can get what they need. Think about Google, think about Ben and Jerry's. These people have done the forefront runner strides in accommodating people with special needs because they have so much to offer. Grandma's like, well, that may be fine in a big city, but we live in this little tiny town. I'm like, trust me, he'll find work and I'll help and Project Search exists. Let's get to work, let's stop complaining. But really to understand that um, accommodations are a thing and to understand that we can disagree and still be friends. We had our last, se our last session yesterday with this mom and, and this child and I'm referring him out. And she says to me before she leaves, she goes, now I know that you and John can't be friends for two years because ethically you can't do that. I said, that's absolutely right. And I, and I hold by that. She goes, but we can still be friends, right? I, I can call you if I have questions or something. <laughs> yes, of course you can. Of course you can. 
people need to be able to express themselves and we're not always going to agree, are we? And that's okay. That's okay. Parents can, parents can be difficult, but we can always get back on track. We have about five to eight minutes remaining uh, for this section before we will take a break. So please feel free to put any other questions into the chat, continue the conversations that's going on in the chat. People are also giving other answers to Emma's questions in the chat um, or raise your hand using the raise hand feature of um, Zoom and we will we will get to that. Um, I am I am curious, can you talk a little bit about, there was something in the chat earlier about the difficulty of trying to teach teachers and I would say any caregivers about the importance of co-regulation. And it strikes me that I've seen a lot of skill building workshops for educators and others about all sorts of things about having to work with kids. But one of the most important things that they could probably learn is co-regulation. Are there good resources out there to try to help people understand that how they are bringing themselves is as important in controlling the environment as any of the rules that they set? Um, a lot of the, the resources that I referred to um, are really, really important. And one of the oldest ones that I always go back to is Barry Prezant. Um, he has a kinder, gentler way of approaching autism spectrum disorders. And when I get too caught up in the behaviorism, I go back to Barry Prezant just because Kindness and compassion and relatability is his forefront. But what I think is really the most helpful for people who are trying to work on co-regulation is mindfulness. And there are so many different what definitions of mindfulness and all the things that we learn, you know, the five steps I can do to calm myself down when I'm anxious and that's mindfulness. And um, There's so much out there, but I think that finding something in the mindfulness genre that makes sense to you as a provider or a parent is the best way to get started. Because what happens is going back to the idea of controlling our own flight or fight, fight response when someone's making our day difficult and we don't understand, being able to bring ourselves back to us and being able to exude that warmth because typically fight or flight is curl up and run as fast as you can protect your inner organs so you don't die those are all really important things to be able to do but when we've got someone who's acting out emotionally um, in whatever way it is that's challenging we need to be able to think okay um, what can i do different and sometimes that thinking needs to be split second when that kid attacked me in my office, it was split second. He was on me before I even saw him get up. It was like a sneeze. We need to be able to go out of ourselves and be that person that can bring sanity, sameness, and calmness to that situation. And it takes practice. It takes a lot of practice. Um, one of the things I've learned recently um, and my sister taught me this. God bless her. She's so avant-garde. She talked to me about gong baths. I'm like, seriously? Gong baths? Yes, Betty, I go and have gong baths. She lives in London. Um, I said, okay. So she sent me videos. And what speaks to me in that genre are singing bowls. And they're a really weird thing. Look them up. For some reason, it resonates to my core, which is great. Um, but I can't always bring up a singing bowl video when I need to get make myself calm and take control of the situation. But I can give myself that feeling. I can take those three seconds and take that breath and think, okay, okay. So John's in the corner and he's throwing everything he can get his hands on. And um Nothing's going to hurt me, really. Do I need to take a break? Do I need to sit on the floor and be less of a target? How do I need to handle the situation? But those are split second thoughts we have. And if we're engaged appropriately with our person, we'll be able to do that. And we'll do that through learning and trial and error. So the mindfulness piece, I think, is 
key for being able to develop that co-regulation skill and look and see whatever makes sense. Um, I've read the book of joy and the art of happiness in the past two years because they've taken me that long to read because I want to be right. And I'm not, um, but really some of the things that have come to me from that reading has changed the way I think about things dramatically. Um, it's kind of amazing. It doesn't happen overnight, but developing the skills is what gets us to that point. And it's all about, in that point, it's all about us and how we develop the skills and make ourselves better people. That's what we impart. All right, Betty, I think we have time. We've got one more question that I caught um, right at the end here that if we address, um, then we'll, I'll, I'll explain what we're doing next after okay. I'm done with this last question. Um, is autistic inertia different than pathological demand avoidance? Yes, absolutely. Um, pathological demand avoidance is something that's done with intent. Autistic inertia is not intent. It's, it's something that overcomes a person and makes them unable to do anything. I think everybody can relate to that feeling of being um, stymied, stuck, paralyzed when somebody drops something, um, Thanksgiving dinner, the dog grabs the turkey and the turkey's on the floor and there we are at the table going, <gasps> and what do we do? We gasp, we can't do anything else. We're just stymied. And everybody starts to race and try to think about what to do first and there's chaos and it should be a movie. Um, but we can all relate to that feeling. Um, when it's autistic inertia, that's that feeling. It, it's, it's, it's up against a wall feeling. It's not something that you have control over unless you can muster that interoceptive skill to figure out yourself as the autistic person, what's holding you back from getting started or stopping. But that pathological avoidance that's just, nope, 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 I won't do it. I can't do it. There's no way you can't make me. That's with intent. And that's where the difference is. So autistic inertia is not intentional avoidance. It's just, what the heck am I supposed to do now? And now I know I'm going to be a failure and the world is awful and I'll never be able to do anything again. Thank you very much. Just call me in a couple of years. That's inertia. So it's not intentional. And I think that's a big difference. I haven't found a lot of writing on that, a lot of research on it, but what I've found has been so insightful. Um, if somebody would like to get more information on that, I'll, um, I'll answer you individually. And you can email me or put it in the chat. Yeah, uh, well, there's a lot of thank yous in the, in the chat for you, Betty. Um, <laughs> and, um, I, I believe you shared your information. If you want to reach out to Betty um, in the future, um, most definitely do. Um, to foreshadow how the rest of today is going to go, um, just in case you only came for Betty, I'm going to put the survey in the, the chat so you can take that as you leave. We'll be taking a, um, a break from 10.15 to 10.30. Uh, and then at that time, we will come back and we will be doing our community piece where we're gonna get together. There are some discussion questions. I'm gonna throw this facilitator's guide in here so you can pre-look to see if you don't have a formal facilitator in your um, group. So facilitators know, identify yourself right away. Say, hey, I was put in here because I'm a facilitator. Some of our groups do not have that because we have so many people today and we don't have that many facilitators. Um, so know that um, you can use that facilitator's guide if you don't have a formal facilitator in there. It has Betty's questions, but the whole point of our gatherings are to be talking to each other. So if your group goes off the, the, the topic at hand, that's fine. Um, go where you're going to go because it's about getting to know each other, um, being a community and, and doing what we've been doing in this chat um, the whole time um, Betty has been talking. And, and really connecting and giving resources. Know that I know while Betty was talking, um, we had a lot of people throw their emails in, in the chat to get resources. We will have the chat and the resources that were put in the chat um, um, given to you once, once we kind of put that all together. Uh, so as long as you registered, and that's key, um, as long as you registered, you'll be getting that email. 
Um, so no need to put your email in the in the chat. That will be provided along with, again, the things that Betty provided us, her resource page, um, her notes page, and her PowerPoint. So know, know those are coming to you as well. So we will see you back at 1030. Um, and then I will explain the breakouts and I'll put you into breakouts and we'll go into our chats. So we'll see you back. Thank you so much, Betty. That was wonderful. Thank um, you, Katie. It was great to be here today. Yeah. Um, and we'll